there is perhaps no other Roman achievement as crucial to urban development as aqueducts. While ancient cities survived for centuries without them, aqueducts forever changed development and people's lives throughout the Roman Empire. This video will tell us more about how this massive feat of ancient engineering worked. One of the foremost experts on Roman aqueducts was Sextus Julius Frontinus, and much of what is known about the subject was written by him. He tells us that Rome existed without aqueducts for the first 441 years of its life. During the first centuries, Rome depended on the waters of the river Tiber, wells, and cisterns. As the population grew, these resources proved to be insufficient and even troublesome. Urban wells started to dry up the groundwater table, while garbage and sewage disposal polluted it. This became more noticeable in densely populated areas, where health risks were high and clean water sparse. Cisterns filled with rainwater were a practical solution for more low-income households, especially in smaller towns like Pompeii. For a metropolis like Rome, however, they were not sufficient particularly in apartment buildings where there was less roof surface area to collect water. It became clear that a more efficient solution was needed as the Romans stepped up their demand for clean running water with the addition of more public baths and hot springs. Aqueducts were the answer to this challenge. Based on the principle of gravity flow, they were meant to carry water from distant sources to the cities. These structures were meant to be channels built on a slight continuous slope, allowing water to flow without the need for pumps. This water would be collected from fountains, reservoirs, and spas, supplying the very heart of the cities. We must remember that aqueducts were not a Roman invention. From ancient times, civilizations all over the world looked for ways to secure a regular and controlled water supply. The earliest forms of aqueducts featured earth-dug tunnels, above-ground canals, clay pipes, and even bridges. But the Romans succeeded in perfecting the already existing techniques and introduced innovative solutions to provide a constant water supply for their cities. In this way, the first Roman aqueduct, the Aqua Appia, was built in 312 BC. Rome had already conquered important territories and was beginning to feel the effects of a growing population and the consequent demand for water. The Aqua Appia was the answer to this need. Supervised by the consul Appius Claudius Xiphus, its construction carried water from some 16 kilometers away to the city. Most of its route was underground, protecting it from both possible attacks and contamination. While its capacity was small and it only supplied a limited part of the city, it was a crucial first step in establishing the aqueduct network that, centuries later, would become one of the wonders of the ancient world. Aqua Appia's resounding success convinced the Romans that it was worth investing in aqueducts. As it grew in prominence, new aqueducts were constructed to cope with the growing demand. The Aqua Marcia, built in 144 BC, about 170 years after the Aqua Appia, is a major example of this effort. It was a milestone in Roman engineering. It not only tapped into springs located over 90 kilometers away, but also included long elevated stretches on arches, a technical breakthrough allowing water to travel over different terrains and reach higher areas of the city. These towering arches became enduring symbols of Roman engineering and inspired future constructions, both in Rome and in other parts of the empire. Only most of these systems were underground, making them not only more cost-effective, but also offering protection against weather damage and mitigating disruption to the surrounding communities. Constructing an aqueduct involved a thorough planning of the route. Roman engineers needed to identify clean water sources to channel to the city. The course between source and destination often entailed natural obstacles, such as hills, valleys, and rivers. To overcome these, engineers devised arched bridges, tunnels, and inverted siphons, all of which displayed the forefront technical knowledge of the time. Crucial to the design of an aqueduct was the steady slope of the canal. The water had to flow naturally, solely by the pull of gravity. This called for almost flawless precision in the construction. One mistake in the slope could prevent the water from stagnating or reaching its intended destination rendering all the effort pointless. Throughout most of their route, the aqueducts ran along underground shafts, 
an economical solution that protected the system from damage and sabotage. As they got nearer to the city and intersected valleys such as the Tiber, the need arose for more visible and monumental structures. It was here that the iconic Roman arcades entered the picture. Stacked in several layers, these stone arches supported the water canals as they passed over low-lying terrain. But maintaining the Roman aqueducts was extremely important for them to work. As they could not simply be turned off, the engineering needed to include solutions for handling the excess water and cleaning out the sediment deposits that could collect in the canals. By the time it reached the city, the water was spread through a complex network of distribution towers called castella and settling tanks. The castella served to control the water flow, dividing it into smaller ducts that supplied public fountains, bathhouses, and private homes. These tanks and towers also separated debris and sediment from the water, assuring that the public and private areas were supplied with high-quality water. Sited in elevated areas, the tanks let the water flow downhill and deposit sediment at the bottom. While effective against larger particles, the settling tanks were not entirely effective against small insects and other floating debris. Despite the advanced technology, the aqueducts experienced deterioration, seepage, and cleaning issues that needed to be addressed. To make it easier to access underground stretches, vertical chambers were built. Also, if any significant repairs were needed, engineers could temporarily divert water from damaged areas. The Curator Aquarum, a special office in the Roman government, oversaw the aqueducts and assured their efficient functioning. Maintenance was so important that up to 700 people were hired to tend to the city's aqueducts, keeping the water system always running properly. The Servi Publici, or public slaves, were crucial to building and maintaining the aqueducts. Contrary to private slaves owned by individuals, the Servi Publici belonged to the state and served on large public projects. Their work included digging tunnels or building canals. They also hauled debris out of aqueducts and even cleaned settling tanks. Some slaves were also tasked with administrative roles, such as controlling materials and supervising daily operations. By the time the empire was at its height, Rome had 11 aqueducts supplying the city with an astonishing water volume. Frontinus also wrote that, by the end of the first century AD, the city had 1,352 public fountains, 254 reservoirs, 15 ornamental nymphs, 11 large imperial baths, and 856 smaller spas. These numbers suggest that the water supply was not just for essential needs, like drinking and cooking. The Romans used water to preserve public hygiene, to feed their large bathhouses, thermi, and even to support industries such as dyeing and urban gardens. Estimates put the total water supplied to the city daily at up to a million cubic meters, even more impressive when you consider that all this was dispensed through a complex aqueduct network. Public fountains were not just water access points. Many of them were lavishly decorated, representing the generosity of the emperor or the sponsors who had funded the construction of the aqueduct. Controlling water distribution was also financial in nature. The general population enjoyed free water from public fountains, but those who preferred to have direct access to it in their homes or for private bathing were charged a fee. As such, aqueducts, besides being a practical necessity, became a means of social status and political control. Large bathhouses such as those of Caracalla and Diocletian absorbed a tremendous volume of water, requiring a constant and generous flow to keep their pools hot warm and cold. Apart from bathhouses, public fountains were a free supply point for the common people, while wealthier households paid to have water piped directly into their homes. The aqueduct also had a key role to play in Rome's entertainment infrastructure, which included the Colosseum's grandiose floods. Naumachiae. These water shows emulated naval battles and demanded a substantial amount of water, which the Roman aqueduct system was able to provide. Notwithstanding their maintenance and security, embezzlement from the Roman aqueducts was a common and clever practice, involving methods that, according to Frontinus, varied from simple tampering to complex schemes. Numerous private users installed clandestine vents in the aqueducts without any authorization. These illegal bypasses allowed them to steal water before it reached its official destination. 
These illegal outlets were, in some cases, kilometers away from the city, in areas where government control was weaker. Fraud often involved bribing state officials and aqueduct workers. Fontanus introduced an inspection system to ensure that water diverting was spotted and punished. He periodically inspected the water ducts and monitored the water flow based on accurate records of permits and distributions. Constructing an aqueduct was frequently a political opportunity to display a ruler's power and benevolence. The Aqua Virgo was an example of this, built on Augustus's orders as he sought to earn public acclaim as Rome's first emperor. He built this aqueduct in 19 BC, bringing water from a spring located 18 kilometers from Rome, supplying around 100,000 cubic meters of water a day. These projects also bolstered the idea that Rome, now as an empire, controlled nature and resources. Aqueducts also established the population's vital dependence on the state. Coins and other artistic records often portrayed aqueducts as symbols of Roman supremacy, both technologically and in social organization. Not surprisingly, Frontinus made a comparison between the Romans and the Egyptians in his writings, equating, in his words, the tall but useless pyramids with Roman aqueducts functionality. This illustrates the pride that Rome had in its capacity to build something that not only made a lasting impression, but also became a symbol of Roman engineering. If you enjoyed learning more about the functioning and maintenance of Roman aqueducts, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. See you in the next one!